We're talking ship today on the podcast. Ship, S-H-I-P, cruise ship jobs specifically. It's part of the Travel Jobs series. How to work on board a cruise ship and get paid to travel the world. Got an amazing show for you today. It's happening right now. So get your sea legs ready. Hop on board. And thanks for being here. (laughs) Welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. You're listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel-based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey there, it's Jason with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show. Thank you so very kindly for hanging out with me, spending a little time, letting me bring a little bit of travel into your ears today. This is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life with as much travel as you desire, no matter what your situation or experience. Thank you, my friend, for being a part of the most incredible global listening community out there. You rebels, you unconventional thinkers. I know, yes, I'm talking to you wherever you are. I don't know. I get, I'm getting emails from all over the place, which of course I love, as you know. And I want to give a quick shout out to Elisa. She dropped me a line last week, said, this email is just a thank you to let you know that your show is truly my happy time, which (laughs) that makes me giddy. I love to hear that. Thanks, Lisa. She goes on to say, I think I've heard every episode. I find it enjoyable and inspiring, not just in regard to travel, but in many ways that apply to everyday living. For me, that has meant a lot of unlearning some of society's arbitrary rules and understanding that you can do things your own way. It's taught me a different way of thinking about my life overall. Thank you. Elisa, thank you. That's um, that's powerful stuff. And uh, I, I'm, it's humbling to hear that. I'm really, truly grateful to know that the show has impacted you in that way. And, uh, you know, I, I loved what she said there, unlearning. That's, um, that's, a, that's something we don't think about too often, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're constantly learning new things, trying to focus on getting new skills, maybe, that can help us do the things we want to do. Or we're just, we're always evolving and learning as human beings. I love to learn. It's one of my favorite, uh, <laughs> it sounds like it's weird to say one of my favorite things, but I do think always be learning is a great motto. It's it's great to to never stop the education. You don't have to be in school or you don't have to have gone and had a higher education to take an attitude of learning. But unlearning is almost more complicated in many ways because you have to unravel things that might be fully embedded that, that you're not even aware of that that you then have to bring to the surface and eradicate in some ways so you can be free and let go. And it's uh, it's a process for sure. And when Elisa said she was doing a lot of unlearning, I mean, I don't think that you're the only one out there, Elisa, that a lot of people out there that are living more unconventionally, I would say, or taking a different approach to life than what society deems to be the right way to do it when using that in air quotes is going to involve unlearning and we're all brought up in different ways and certainly we're going to learn things on the way that don't necessarily fit into the new type of lifestyle the new things we want to do and then we have to unlearn so we can conquer those fears and that that's a deep conversation we could we could definitely do a whole podcast about that but i just wanted to let you know elisa and if you're listening to this maybe you can chime in you can always send me an email to jason at zero to travel.com are you unlearning anything right now are you currently unlearning let me know what you're unlearning elisa you are not alone that's for sure i think all of us are going through this unlearning process at various times. So thanks so much for sharing your email today. And speaking of learning and unlearning, we're going to learn about cruise ship jobs today. I'm hoping this show is going to be smooth sailing. Uh, You know what? I'm so... I know. The cheesy puns, I just can't help myself. I want to stop. I really... If there's a help, help, help group out there for punny guys like me that just love to 
bombard any dialogue with puns. If I see an in, I'm taking the pun. I'm just going right for it. But uh, so sometimes I, I do hold myself back. Anyway, it's too easy with, with the cruise ship jobs. <laughs> there, there are a lot of puns we can use. Yes, I did say right in the beginning, we're talking ship today, which I, uh, I am excited about because cruise ship jobs are one of those things that I never got to do. I talk about this a little bit in the interview, but always found intriguing. But travel jobs have been a huge part of my travel life. And that's how I ramped up and started hitting the road and saving a bunch of money and seeing the world at the same time. And not everybody's into the location independent thing. If you if you are, we have a community called Location Indie that can help you out with that. But some people are looking for jobs that either require them to travel or allow them to go on an adventure, but still make money. And of course, your businesses can do that if you're running a business from the road. But it's not always easy in the beginning. And getting a job that requires you to travel is a way that you can hit the road immediately. Think about it. If you get a cruise ship job, all of a sudden you're working on a cruise ship. So you're on the cruise, you're traveling the world, and you're making money. It's one of those things where it can instantaneously kick start a life of travel, put you right in to a life of travel, really. My expert today certainly knows her stuff. You're going to learn a ton like the number one reason to work on a cruise ship, the pros and cons, how much money you can expect to earn, what are the best types of jobs on board the ship, on and on and on. If you want to get an in-depth resource around getting cruise ship jobs beyond the podcast, zerototravel.com slash cruise. Zerototravel.com slash cruise will take you to a page. You're going to see an epic article of epic resource that was written by Amanda and it gives you even more detail on some of the topics we hit on today. She goes deep, but you can consider that a companion piece to this podcast, zero to travel.com slash cruise if you're specifically interested in cruise ship jobs. And if you're listening and you're not going to do anything with travel jobs, I still think you're going to enjoy this show. A lot of interesting perspectives like I try to include in all of my podcasts for everybody to enjoy. Of course, there are going to be some tips here that cross over to job hunting in general. And it was just a great conversation with a new friend. Please enjoy listening on our chat, learning about cruise ship jobs and getting paid to travel the world on board a cruise ship. And I will see you on the other side, my friends. <laughs> My guest today is a cruise ship employment specialist. She traveled all over the world for 10 years working on board cruise ships. Then, after working on the ships, she moved into shoreside cruise ship recruitment and employment services to help cruise lines hire candidates. What I'm saying is she knows the ins and outs of what it takes to get a job on board a cruise ship, and that's exactly what she does. She helps adventurers land cruise ship jobs and get paid to travel the world. Not a bad gig. Amanda Hawthorne Geary, welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Jason. I am super excited to be here. Thrilled to have you here. We've been talking quite a bit because I'm pretty fascinated with uh, the whole cruise ship job deal, because I came from a travel jobs background. I spent uh, many years, about the same as you, over a decade working on the road, but in different industries. And the cruise ship industry is one that I never actually made my way to, although I was kind of intrigued about it. But I can totally see how it's very similar to like the event work I was doing, where you can come on for contracts, you can save a lot of money because you're not paying for rent or accommodations. And, and there's all these different perks around travel. So I want to dig into all that stuff with you today. But first, I, mean, I kind of have to start with like, how did you land in the cruise ship industry? Because I, I don't know if it was like an intentional thing for you. Like somebody listening to this might be like, oh, that's a cool way to travel. I didn't think about Then they're going to go check it out. But how did it work for you? Um, for me, I have to say, um, I kind of had a little bit of an unfair advantage starting out in the fact that I was sort of almost born into it. Actually, I, I was literally born into the marine industry. My, my father was a ship's captain for many, many years. Um, and so actually when I was born, I actually spent the first 
three years of my life uh, living on a cargo ship. We were doing Miami to South America and all the way over to Australia. My mom, of course, lived on board with us. And that's how I initially started my years at sea. So the 10 years that I worked on board cruise ship, I don't actually count the first three years of my life, which I guess would bring it to like more like 13, 14. But that's how I sort of started my marine based life. And then when my parents came ashore, when I was about three, four years old, they actually started their own marine recruitment uh, company, uh, really focusing more on deck and tech side of things, hiring bridge officers and things like that. My dad ended up going back into um, law school. He became a marine lawyer. I still is. And my mom has continued on with marine recruitment. And actually, she's been in marine recruitment now for over 35 years. So it really, it's sort of been a family based business and how I kind of found out or lived the life of working on board. But it wasn't until I reached my university years that I really started seeing it as a possible career opportunity for myself. Was it a water birth when you were born too? Because you could add a little bit, uh, even more water time there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will, actually, my mom did have me back uh, at home in Vancouver, British Columbia, but she found out that she was pregnant with me in Australia after a, a two month crossing, and she she had already been on the ship for a year or so with my dad, and she couldn't figure out why on that crossing she was so much more seasick than she normally. She didn't really get seasick, so she found out why when we arrived in Australia. It was me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There was, there was another reason. I mean, well, that's one of the many concerns I guess we can talk about today is seasickness. That's something I, I hadn't even thought too much about, but that's obviously a huge thing to consider, but I know these boats are really big. So anyway, we're going to get into all this, but that's, uh, that's interesting that you, you basically got your sea legs. Like you had no choice, but to get your sea legs essentially. Do you remember any of that? Like you were pretty young. I was pretty young. Um, there are little snippets that I remember. Um, and obviously, I have pictures and things like that. I, I remember tiny little bits. I actually, interestingly, um, my the whole ship was Spanish speaking crew, except for my mom and my dad. Uh, so initially, when my mom had me, I got back on board, you know, a few months later. So I was about, you know, six or seven months old. But my first words were all Spanish because I had a Spanish um, room steward who was sometimes nanny for me. And I still to this day actually understand a lot. I understand a lot of Spanish, but I can't speak it. But that was because we were completely surrounded by that language while we were on the ship. So that's kind of like an interesting side note. But I actually did have issues learning how to walk because with a cargo ship, in comparison to a cruise ship, there are no stabilizers on a cargo ship. So it is quite rocky when you're out in open sea. So my mom did say that I was quite frustrated during the whole learning how to walk process. But I can tell you when I did get on ships later as you know, working on board, I do not get seasick at all. And I probably you know, I don't want to brag, but I, I, I have some of the best sea legs I think I've seen out there. Like I don't, <laughs> I think it was because I had to learn from a very early age to, to keep my balance. Yeah. You're probably a great walker too. <laughs> you're like, yeah, nobody I, can knock you over. Cause you're just, <laughs> you're so used yeah. to balancing. I mean, it's already like, if you see kids trying to walk, they look like drunken sailors anyway. So you just add that into like the whole boat environment. That's funny. That's a funny image. So, um, okay. So you're in college and, You've been around this sort of nautical world through your family, but uh, what were you kind of thinking in college? Was this, you said you started thinking about maybe this could be a career, but I don't necessarily think that's the reason a lot of people fall into cr the cruise ship industry, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you came from a different background, but for you, how did that sort of um, transition take place where, where you were deciding what you were going to study and you were thinking maybe this would be an option. And then, you know, given the, the breadth of your experience, for most people, how do they land up? How, how do they end up in this industry? Yeah, that's okay. So that's like multi-part questions. So yeah. That's really good. I'm, so I'm really when bad I was... at uh, asking multi-part questions. I got to get <laughs> better good. asking one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. So when I was in university, I uh, went into outdoor recreation, parks and tourism. It was a four-year program. And so that I was definitely new, you know, adventuring and doing something outdoors and tourism, like that's the industry I did, I was sort of directing myself into as well as teaching. I also have, um, and I'm a certified teacher as well. So halfway through, it was about my second year in university, 
uh, my mom actually told me that she was starting to delve into hotel recruitment on board the cruise ships. Prior to this, she'd really kind of stuck more to deck and tech hiring. But she told me about this opportunity that had come up with Princess Cruises to work on board as a seasonal youth staff. Before this point, I definitely thought, you know, oh, working on a cruise ship would be great. But, you know, it's such a long commitment. You have to do six months. But she actually told me that there was a seasonal option coming up. And this meant, you know, contracts for two to 12 weeks. I decided to try it out one summer, um, halfway through university, try it out and work on board. And, and it was awesome. So I worked on board as a seasonal youth staff. And then what I did for the rest of my university career is I just made sure I got on board every single university break that was possible. Christmas, spring break, American Thanksgiving, um, and all the summers. And when I finished university a few years later and had my teaching certification was when there was an opening on board for onboard crew trainer. And then I just sort of continued on. <laughs> that is awesome. Like when I was in college and many moons ago and I would come home for the summer, or whatever, I'm, I'm like trying to scrounge up positions at like the, the local diner where I was a cook and a waiter or like, um, you know, I, I was landscaping out in, out in the the sweltering heat. And meanwhile, you're on cruise ships, <laughs> cruising around the world. I wish this was something I knew about. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a cool thing. And I didn't know that, um, for those, uh, who are those of us who are non-committal, uh, in many ways, those, those smaller job, uh, contracts seem to be pretty appealing for, uh, a wide variety of people, I'm sure. Um, and I know some people want more stability. Some people want more flexibility. Uh, we might as well talk a little ship right now, right? <laughs> Yeah. We talk some ship. We were joking <laughs> yeah. before we got on this interview. So let's talk some ship. So we're uh, we're going to get into it. And first, I want you to totally unsell us on working on a cruise ship. Why shouldn't we work on a cruise? Or what are what are the cons? I guess I would say. Yeah, definitely. There, are, it's not for everyone. That is for sure, right? There are definitely huge benefits, but there are definitely challenges as well. So one of the challenges can be um, you're working seven days a week. So whether it's, you know, a seasonal or a full contract, you are always working seven days a week. Some days you're only going to be working a, a handful of hours. Some days you're going to be pulling like a full, you know, 10 to 12 hours. So if you're not work, you know, if you're not open to working seven days a week, it, that definitely can be a challenge for some people. The other thing is it's a lot of split shifts. So those full 10 to 12 hour days, often that happen on sea days when the ship is sailing all day, you know, you're doing a lot of three to four hour split shifts. That can be a little tough too for some people that aren't used to that. Um, of course, then also there's potential homesickness, right? If you sign on for a full contract right from the get go, then you can be away from home for, you know, six to eight months at a time. And if you haven't been away from home before and you haven't traveled before, that can be that can take some adjusting as well. Life on the boat. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. whole different animal. And these things are like mm -hmm. moving cities, it seems like. I mean, you've got I haven't really been on a proper cruise. You know, I have been on cruise ships for like a like a half day thing that was like a bigger ship but not the size of of what you're talking about there are so many different positions and i want to talk to you about like the types of things you can do but that that was like sort of the bad news like seven days a week you're kind of slammed split shifts you can be working multiple times a day you're basically your life is working on this ship you don't have too much of of a life outside of work well you have a social life on the ship and i guess we'll talk about that but i mean you're you're on a ship right you're not like hey i'm gonna take off and you know go meet my friend for a beer or whatever like you're out at sea for months at a time that's i guess the bad news not for everybody although for the adventurous or uh, those that don't mind being away for months at a time i mean i i think it's a very intriguing thing what are all the perks what are like the the cool parts about it yeah i definitely think that there are for me personally, anyway, there were way more pros and there were cons for sure. Number one, and I think everyone would agree with this, is the ability to get paid, literally paid to see the world. And I have been to every single continent in the world and hundreds of cities um, and I've been paid to do it. And so that was the number one thing, you know, there's so many people out there and I'm sure your listeners too, you know, that, you know, you, you, you work so hard and you save up for this amazing vacation, say once a year, but you're getting to experience what people 
people are on the boat with you that have paid hundreds and thousands of dollars to be there and you're getting to see all this for free. So the travel aspect for sure. Number one, uh, the number two thing for me was the ability to save money. That was massive. And I think you just kind of noted that about being in university and you get home and you're like finding a job on land and you're having to still pay for the incidentals, the groceries and rent and stuff like that. But when you're on a cruise ship, even if you're in an entry level position making a starting level salary, you really don't have any expenses. So it's a fantastic way to save a really great amount of money while you're on contract. So that is for me, like definitely like the huge benefit number two. And then Again, for me personally, number three was the ability to see very, very quickly all of the other opportunities. Once I was on board in the youth staff role, you know, I saw and I moved up to the security department. From there, I went into crew training. From there, I went into HR. So if you are someone that really starts to love it after a few contracts, the promotional opportunities are huge it could, because cruise lines are only getting bigger and they're only growing more and more by the day. So it's, you know, a never ending growth industry. So there are tons of opportunities for people out there that want to stay long term and make it a career. On the travel side, you mentioned all the hours you have to work. I mean, do you really feel like you get ample time to see things? What is how does that work? Mm, it's a really good question. So it is somewhat dependent on the position that you have. There are definitely positions on board that get tons of poor time. And I'll give you an example. Uh, for example, casino or retail staff, those two areas of the ship need to be by law closed when in port. That's actually a law. Okay. So those staff members they get some of the best port time right. I've ever seen. Um, so, you know, there's definitely certain departments, certain roles that are going to get you more port time than others. But even that being said, you know, during a typical cruise, seven to 10 days in duration, there'll be three or four sea days, three or four port days. Sea days, you know, everyone's on the ship, you're sailing, not stopping, everyone's working, right? That's going to be your busiest days. But then on the port days, pretty much, you know, every department we don't need every single crew member from every single department on board during a port day. Most of the guests are off enjoying the sites. So what managers will do is schedule people off for either a half day or sometimes a full day, not a full 24 hour period, but maybe a full daytime <laughs> period off to go and enjoy the sites. And you'll share that with your department in a rotational basis. So if you do you happen to miss a port that you wanted to see one week, then most likely your ship's going to come back and do that same itinerary the next week. So you can always catch it the week after or the week after that. So, you know, it will, it will, there is ample time, I believe, and I have experience to get off and enjoy the sites and actually do even more things like take free, completely free and paid for passenger tours as well as a crew escort that not only do you get to see these amazing places, but you get to do epic tours like dog sledding and wine tasting and whatever that passengers are those Are, are those real examples that you've... Yeah. Yeah. That I've done. Yeah. You, you just get like a... <laughs> went on a dog sledding adventure with the guests yeah. and you go for free. Yes. So I was in Alaska. I did that. You know, I swam with stingrays in the Caribbean, did that, did wine tasting in Tuscany, went to the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. I mean, got to feed um, kangaroos in Australia. I mean, the list is endless. And I would just sign up to be a crew escort on these tours. Basically, you're a representative of the company on my day or half day off and get to experience this awesome stuff completely for free. <laughs> That's so great. And I'm sure the, the list can go on and on with some of the mm -hmm. experiences you've had, which is, uh, like you said, it's your job is to be part of this thing that people are paying like thousands of dollars to be part of as, as their vacation. So you're going to be in cool places. You're going to be exposed to new things along the way. Well, just to go back a little bit, you talked about doing this in university, but I mean, there are different types of jobs for all ages, right? It's not restricted. I mean, is there an age restriction, like a minimum age? Yes. Yeah, so most major cruise lines do have a minimum 21 or over requirement that meets uh, American age of majority. That is typical. There are some departments that will hire slightly younger um, and some cruise lines, but it is 
tends to be a little bit rare to find anyone under 21. And then there is no maximum age, actually. The oldest funny story, the oldest crew member I've ever worked with in my department as a youth staff when I first started was a lady named Patty from the U.S., and she was over 75 years nice. old. She was a seasonal youth staff. She was awesome. Now, is that typical? No, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you do get a variety of ages, though. Yeah, um, for sure. And the career opportunities, that's something I think people that are maybe younger that are considering doing this for the travel aspect, which I'm sure a lot of people get into it for that. I know that was one of the reasons why I was intrigued by it originally back in the day. Uh, I, I think like the jobs that I did, there are a lot of hidden benefits. And I think that's one of them. The, the things that people see are like the service level things, but you don't think, oh, I'm going to do this. Like you, you, I think oftentimes you go into these seasonal jobs or like these temporary jobs like this. And you're like, oh, I'll do this for a little while. And, um, and then I'll move on to something like when I figure it out or whatever. But there is so much value in the experience you get. And I think that even if you don't continue along, uh, you know, in the cruise ship industry, you're still getting a lot of different skills that can be valuable for all types of future jobs. And I think that was just, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I think that's something to, to point out that gets lost in all of this. Oh, yeah, there are, I mean, you know, working on a cruise ship is, oh, wow, you just get your hands in so many different things because you are, because you're working seven days a week, employers will know, hey, this person knows what it is like to work extremely hard all the time. You are not only working at your job, but you're also living at your job. So you're living and working with everyone that is in your department. So that takes, I think, a special um, understanding as well. You're working with up to, you know, 55 plus different nationalities. So working in a multicultural environment, you're getting those skills. And then, you know, really working on a cruise ship, it's like working in a five star plus resort or hotel ashore. So if you are considering staying in the hospitality realm of things, when you do get home, say, it's kind of your gold ticket to work in any hotel restaurant whatever ashore and lots of my fellow crew members who have decided to come ashore at some point that's sort of what they've done they've stepped off and then stepped into amazing high level managerial jobs shoreside yeah and i mean i'm glad you uh you kind of brought that stuff up like the the skills for example dealing with all different types of people from all different nationalities just that is such an awesome life experience to have and such such a great uh, skill to develop for, for yourself, I think, that can benefit you in so many ways in life. So I really think that, uh, it, again, if you're listening to this and you're considering like this type of travel job or other jobs like this, you know, people volunteer on farms when they travel, they do different things. Like there are all these hidden benefits that I think are, are important to, uh, to consider and that will benefit you beyond just this particular career or whatever. So, um, daily life on the, on the cruise ship, like I would love to, for you to like take us to the, to the planks of the ship and we can smell the salty sea and we're like, we're now we're sharing a cabin with you and you're starting your day. Like give us the whole, I, and I know it's going to vary depending on your job, but can you give us a little like walkthrough on what a typical day is like working on board one of these ships? Yeah, I'll probably, I'll walk you through sort of like the entry level position where I started as youth staff and I might give you some additional information as well, but like maybe higher up positions as well in management. But if you're in an entry level role, yeah, you're right. You're going to be waking up uh, with your roommate. Someone's going to be on the top bunk and someone's going to be on the but bottom Please bunk. tell me there's coffee. I want some coffee <laughs> with my salty sea smell. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so you'll be heading to you'll be getting dressed and you'll be heading straight to the crew mess or the staff mess to grab your coffee yeah. and breakfast for the morning, <laughs> um, have a chat with people, get ready for the day. And then you'll either have, you know, potentially a staff meeting, depending on the department that you're a part of, or you'll just go straight into work and start um, implementing things as youth staff. That means opening up one of the youth centers, greeting the children that are arriving, signing them in. And this is typical for like a sea day, for example, and uh, implementing the awesome activities and programs that the youth coordinator, your manager, has already designed, you know, weeks prior. So you're really just facilitating things, having the fun 
You'll shut down the center for lunch so the kids will get picked back up by their parents. In most cases, they'll have lunch. You'll have your lunch, have a couple hour break. Maybe you'll do, throw some laundry in, <laughs> for example. Um, and then you'll head back to work around two. Same thing, tons of fun activities. Maybe go up to the top deck to do some sports games with the kids. Parents will pick them back up again for dinner. You'll have your dinner, have a little chat with your friends again, dry your laundry, pick it up, and bring it back to your cabin and uh, head back to work. And then that might be, say, 7 to 10 p.m., for example. Then you'll get off work. You'll head back to your cabin, throw some casual clothes on, say, head down to maybe the the crew gym, or maybe you'll head to the crew bar with your time friend. for a shift beer. I was going to say, yeah, shift beer, yeah. <laughs> and then um, yeah, and then head to bed, and that'll kind of be a sea day. On a port day, you know, if you've got that day off, you will wake up. There'll probably be a crew drill on a port day. That's when they love to do drills to practice safety um, requirements. Important. So you'll be doing a crew drill. Then you'll head off, and maybe you'll be in the Caribbean. If you were like me, I got to do an amazing America's Cup sailing race tour, which was awesome. And I got to captain an America's Cup yacht nice. for the day. So maybe you'll do that and, and go for lunch with some of your crew friends and come back and around five and have dinner and then head to shift. Maybe you'll work from seven to 10 and, and you'll do it all over again. And the next day you'll be in some other country or place. <laughs> Uh, it sounds good. I, you didn't tell me if the food was included. I'm wondering like when you get breakfast and lunch, are these meals included? Yes. So everything is provided. So depending on your position, you'll have the various areas that you're able to eat in. So I talked about the crew mess, which is the crew dining area or the staff mess. Um, as youth staff, I also had the ability to utilize the passenger buffet, uh, the passenger specialty restaurants. So with some companies, passenger area privileges are a little bit more flexible than others. But with the companies that I worked with, it was quite, quite flexible. And then when I was in a managerial role, I was, I was pretty much making my own schedule. So I was designing when my training courses were happening, I was designing when my HR office hours were. So when it came to taking what ports I wanted off, I I was kind of in charge of that at that point in my career. So you're like, oh, I want to go sledding with the dogs. Oh, I want to do this. I think I'll go on a wine tour in Napa. And you were just booking these things for yourself. Yeah, (laughs) love it. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. (laughs) Yeah. And that was the thing, too. I mean, there wasn't really much point in, say, having doing a training class in the middle of a port day because I knew that crew that had time off, if they had a choice of going in port or coming to one of my training classes on the middle of a port day, they're going to get off the ship. So I would, I would schedule my classes in accordance to when I knew crew would actually be attending, which would not be in the middle of a port day. <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> During the crew drill and, and uh, at various times, I imagine there's a lot of bad Titanic references and different things going on on the boat, like iceberg right ahead and all these things. I'm just imagining these terrible jokes anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. So that's a, a daily life. And I, I, I love how you, uh, you actually got some laundry done <laughs> during during that yeah. during that daily life uh, laundry picture. Super, yeah, laundry yeah. is super important. Um, you know, you're gonna be wearing your uniform most of the time, which is done free of charge uh, from the company. But you've got lots. You know, you've got your own socks, your own undies, your own you know casual wear. And um, you know, laundry is free on board, but it can be hard to get that machine. So you got to plan it. That's why I threw that in. Yes. Well done. <laughs> Good job. I'm glad we have some clean clothes now. Um, okay. So we've talked about the types of jobs, but we haven't actually covered it. I was wondering if you could break that down a little bit. And I think this would be a good time to share some of the, uh, the expected pay scales that people, that people should, should get for those general types of positions. And I know there are a lot of different types of positions, but um, for somebody listening to this, let's make the assumption that, um, you know, this is somebody who's, who's new, maybe you can break down some of the positions that they should go for. And, um, and maybe, and or maybe somebody who has a little bit of experience and, and like the ones that they should maybe keep their eye on as they might be uh, desirable positions in the future. Mm, Okay, this is a biggie. So let me think what's the best way to start. So what I will say first off is that 
any position that's going to be on a cruise ship for the most part are the same positions that exist in any big resort or in any big hotel. So that's generally how you can kind of think about it when you think about what positions might be available, plus a ton more that I'm going to talk about as well. When it comes to hierarchy on board, the crew is split up into sort of three levels. You have the, the crew, which is lower level, entry level positions. Then you've got what's called staff, which is sort of still crew, but you're considered a staff member. You're more front of house dealing with guests uh, really, really closely. And then you have what's called officer level, which includes all of, you know, the bridge officers, but also, uh, you know, any supervisors or managers often within the hotel department side of things. So that's kind of like the three levels of crew. And with, with each of those levels come different benefits, different privileges, different pay structures, things like that. So the crew is really the bulk of the the majority of the people working on board the crew includes departments like um, housekeeping uh, accommodation staff you've got laundry staff dining staff wait staff bar staff all those sorts of people and then you've got the staff which i mentioned which are more front of house so those include cruise activity staff youth staff retail staff casino staff photo staff um, you know, think of oh, front desk staff, people like that. And then you've got the officer level, which I noted, you know, bridge officers, people responsible for driving the ship, but also it includes any managers or supervisors of the departments that I have just mentioned. So that's kind of breakdown of generally the departments that are available to work within. Most cruise lines will require a minimum of one to two years of relevant experience shoreside for any of the positions that you're going to apply for on board. So if you wanted to say apply for a retail sales position on board, they would be looking for at least one to two years of high-end retail sales experience ashore for a position on board. So that's something very important to think about as well. If you are thinking about this as an option for yourself, what experience do you have currently that would match up with a role on board? And that kind of delves me into, you know, what are some of the best positions or best entry level positions to get into? The reason I fell into youth staff was, you know, basically from when I was 14 years old, I had always worked with kids. I was working at day camps, summer camps, water parks. So by the time that I applied for the youth staff role, I already had years of experience working with youth in large scale settings, which was, you know, what they were asking for. I think a lot of university aged people and, you know, millennials, let's say a lot of us have worked with kids at some point in our life, whether it's teaching or day camps or babysitting or whatever. So youth staff can be a great entry level position to break into. Also, it's awesome because a lot of cruise lines have those seasonal opportunities. So you can actually try it out short term and see if it's really for you before you decide to do a longer term contract. Right. Like then if you can't, if you can't cut it for two weeks, then it's probably not for yeah. you. Right. <laughs> exactly. And that's, you know, I've definitely haven't seen that often happen, but I've seen it happen. Sure. And then there's other positions like, um, Crew staff, so cruise activity staff. So if you've ever hosted or organized events or activities, that's an awesome one to break into. There's retail sales. A lot of people have some basic retail sales experience, you know, in their back pocket. Uh, hotel front desk, if you've ever worked in the hotel front desk field. Those sort of five are definitely ones that I would recommend as great entry level. And also photographers, too. If you have any photography experience, studio, freelance that kind of thing, or photo training, that's an awesome position to break into as well. Those five are kind of the ones that people um, have an easy time breaking into because they're quite large departments on board. So cruise lines are always, always looking for people to fill those roles, particularly. Okay, that's a great breakdown. And I mean, you just gave a lot of examples that involve like you said, onshore or whatever the term is, you use onshore jobs that a lot of people have done, you know, working in restaurants, uh, working with kids. I mean, there's plenty of ways to um, spin it, I'm sure. And we can get into that a little bit <laughs> later in regards to like what, how people should represent themselves and their resumes and everything. Um, but when it comes to breaking in, where should people start? Like what would be step one? Would it be to go to the cruise line website and look for jobs? I mean, what, what was kind of, what would be your advice for that first step for people to take? And I know, you know, we're going to cover a lot in this interview and I know on your website, 
talk a lot about this and there are some nuanced things to this that um you know Amanda and I are getting together to to help you out with some of these things but I think it's really good to get a comprehensive overview here and for somebody like that's going to get off this podcast and they're like oh my god like I need to look something up right now you know outside of that stuff like where where would you begin So I would begin with the cruise line's main websites, uh, just to kind of get a feel for what cruise line you might most like to work with. All cruise lines sort of offer a different level of service, a different type of style to their guests. So you will definitely want to get on the cruise line's main sites and see, you know, what is this cruise line about? How many ships do they have? Are they growing right now? What type of itineraries do they do? They have big, do they have big ships? Do they have small ships? You know, what type of experience do you want? as a crew member, because definitely the line that you work with will somewhat dictate what sort of experience you will have. So for example, a large line like Royal Caribbean, you know, you've got an ever-growing fleet, you've got tons of itineraries, but you have really, really big ships. So they definitely tend to go into sort of larger, more touristy places because of that. If you want sort of more of a cultural experience, smaller places, you might want to look at smaller cruise lines like Seaborne Cruise Lines or p Australia that have less ships, smaller fleets, but go into more exotic locales that maybe aren't as touristy. So start taking a look at their main websites. I will warn you, though, when you do go to their main websites, keep in mind, of course, that these websites are designed with the passenger in mind. They're designed to advertise to guests, not to crew members. It can be very, very hard to find the official employment information on these websites. It's often hidden on a contact page or a footer, or it's it's like finding a needle in a haystack. We didn't cover the money yet, really. If you want to give a, a little bit of a sense of, I know this is going to be general because we're talking about multiple companies and different types of positions, but for somebody that's breaking in and maybe doing one of the aforementioned jobs, I don't know, may, maybe crew or like lower level staff or whatever you want to call it what would they expect to make and save? I think that's that's the big thing we talked about. I mean, you're not paying for your accommodations. You're not paying for food. So, of course, it's all going into the bank. So take take that into account when you hear these numbers. <laughs> yeah. Um, interestingly, actually, a lot of cruise lines are going to be very, very similar across the board when it comes to entry-level positions and starting salaries. So kind of like the five kind of positions that I mentioned, which were like nice, easy access entry level roles like youth staff or crew staff, photo, front desk. Um, Funnily, they all kind of start in the same realm of monthly payment and you are paid monthly in most cases. You are looking at somewhere between a thousand and eighteen hundred ish USD per month in cash. And that is generally very, very typical for an entry-level position on board, uh, particularly at the staff level. Um, Crew level can be slightly less base than that, but often at the crew level, you have a lower level of base, but you have a higher tip opportunity. So maybe um, see if you were in housekeeping or something like that, you might only be coming in between six and 800 per month, but then your tips are going to be somewhere in between five and hundred to a thousand plus. So that's kind of how that works. And then if you're on a six month contract, then you are saving like all of that, unless you're a crazy shopper ashore, but um, basically you're saving all of that, which is amazing. And then once you reach a supervisory or managerial level position, which is what I did. So I, you know, the whole way through university, I was starting in that the 1200 range with youth stuff and Once I started on board as a crew trainer, so that was five years into my 10 years, my wage skyrocketed. I was making three to four times that. And then when I finished up as HR manager, I was in like more of the five to six per month range, uh, you know, which was crazy. So, you know, in my first year of working full time on ships at a managerial level, uh, which was right when I finished university, I paid off all of my student loans in one year. So I paid off over $35,000 in student loans my first full-time year working at sea. Yeah, and and of course, because you're not 
paying for all those things we talked about. And also, if you're not commuting to work, you're not paying for gas, you don't have a car, and all this stuff goes on and on. So it sounds like not a lot, but then when you factor in everything else uh, and tips and everything like that, and I know there's opportunity to, to get more. So uh, again, this is all the stuff you got to consider when you're looking into this. And really, I think a big part of this too is just the adventure and having some kind of different experience. And if, if you do it for a handful of months or whatever, and I'm sure the cruise lines, you know, are going to recognize people that, that stick around because once you get one under your belt, is it kind of like that? If you get one under your belt and then you're, you're ready to do another one, they're like, Oh, you're proven. Do you think you have a little more leverage to negotiate? Oh yeah. Most cruise lines, what will happen is after you've done a, a first contract, and you keep coming back, your wage will go up by 100 to $200 per month um, each contract. That is very, very typical um, to happen. So there's that as well. And what I'd like to remind people of in addition is, although those starting salaries sound sound low, you know, like a 1200 bucks, that kind of sounds pretty low. But if you can honestly tell me that after all of your expenses ashore, rent, groceries, going out, gas, if you can honestly tell me you are saving, not touching a thousand dollars a month, even I'll be shocked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right? it's, uh, everybody's got their own situation, so it's 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 hard to say, but it's it can be very difficult, I think, to save money. Um, mm-hmm in the quote real world, I'm not calling the cruise ship world, the real world, because it's almost like an alternative reality in some ways. And, and I get it because all the jobs I did, I know how that is. It's a different kind of way to live. It's a different kind of thing to do, but it's a, it sounds like a cool experience. So how competitive are these jobs? Because I feel like this is something that a lot of people would want to do, but maybe I'm wrong. I often find with these types of jobs, it's like people think they're more competitive than they actually are. And it's just about putting yourself out there in the right way. Mm. These jobs, depending on the cruise line, can be really, really competitive. I like to think of the cruise lines as sort of like you've got your A, B, and C level kind of cruise lines. You have your very, very high end, like six star level service, Cunard, Seaborn kind of cruise lines, which those lines can be hard to break into if you don't have a really solid foundation in your experience prior to applying. And then there's other cruise lines that are maybe smaller, not as well known. Um, that are a little bit more flexible with the experience that they're going to require. So there's definitely that to consider as well. Generally speaking, though, it is pretty highly competitive, you know, because the cruise lines hire internationally. I can say personally, from my own experience, just working with an official hiring partner for many years, just in Canada, we on average would get somewhere between 500 and a thousand applications a day. What? That would be, that would be just the Canadian applicants. <laughs> and then when I was, when I was working in the main offices, when I was crew training, like in LA, for example, I worked in LA and also in Sydney, Australia for another cruise line in the office for a few months, they were getting thousands of applications per day. So I can definitely say the competition with the amount of resumes coming in can be overwhelming. I think what people can definitely do to make sure that they stand out right away is to make sure that their objective on their resume is very, very clear. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've seen when I was in recruitment resumes that would say, any job available, I'm good with anything. Those are the resumes that get put in the special file called delete because oh. they're not specific enough. I oh, know that people okay. putting that on the top of their resume want to be super flexible and open. But the thing that people need to remember is that when you're applying to a cruise, cruise line or even a partner, there's so many coming in that you ha- there's a there's a reviewer that's spending only 10 seconds max on each resume coming in to quickly scan it to figure out where to send it. If you don't have a very clear objective with I'm applying for a retail sales position or I'm applying for a youth staff position. It's not going to end up in the hands of the right person to even have a further look at. So that's definitely one thing for sure right away that people can do to make sure they stand out. That's a great tip. I mean, I I would think I, I would have thought, you know, being flexible and being like, Hey, I'm the type of person that's willing to do anything. Like I'm willing to work hard, but, uh, that's, that's not the way to go. And that's, uh, that's a that's a true hardcore like the fact that you've worked behind the scenes and you've been the person going through these resumes or alongside of them you know that that's the reality of it i mean they're scanning it quickly so just to be clear 
you know, take a direction and, and actually apply for something. That's, that's a super awesome tip. How else can people stand out? Like outside of that, what are some of the other things people get wrong? Or do you have another couple quick tips like that that can help people? Mm, for sure. I think as well, making sure that you're applying for roles that you really know that you have at least some semblance of experience in. I know people get really excited about applying for a cruise line and they might apply for like six different jobs that they see posted, but really you're only, you only really have experience in the field of maybe one or two. Don't go crazy. Like just honestly, I'm not saying don't apply for roles that you get excited about, but make sure you have at least some experience that's related to the role that you are going for. That's for sure. Number one. Um, another tip is to add a picture, hundred percent, add a picture, a nice headshot is perfect. It doesn't need to be professional, but just a nice little picture, you know, shoulders up, preferably wearing something that is closely in resemblance to what you notice is the uniform for that position on the cruise lines. Main webpage is great. Um, just so they can put a face to the name. They really like to see that. I know it's not required, when I was in recruitment, you don't know how many odd pictures we would get on people's applications. Um, don't use your graduation yeah. photo from high school. <laughs> don't have a photo with like you and your friends and um, behind. I saw odd photos like behind trees and just like weird, like just a nice clean headshot. <laughs> plain background yeah. is for sure a great keep it classy, right San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I uh, I used to work for a staffing agency, so I've seen some of the uh, these types of pictures as well. And um, shocking, shocking what some people sent in. <laughs> it's interesting for sure. And then I guess another like final tip would be to create like a short little YouTube intro video. So put it up on YouTube, like maybe thirty to sixty seconds. Who you are, what position you're applying for, why you think you'd be a great fit. Um, upload it to YouTube, add the link to your cover letter. And it just kind of adds something a little extra. It shows that you've done the research on that particular cruise line that you are interested in that particular role with that cruise line. And they really get a chance to see you in action quickly and make a very quick decision as to whether or not they want to progress with what often is an initial Skype interview. Hmm. And for that interview, if you land one uh, outside of you know, being outgoing, being enthusiastic, I would imagine, you know, being knowledgeable about the company. Is there anything else in particular that people should do to prepare if they get that far? I would say to make sure that, yes, you're adequately prepared. If it is a Skype interview, that you're dressing as if you were meeting them in person. So business attire, for sure. You have a copy of your resume and your cover letter there so you can refer to it. That you have at least, you know, five or so questions that you would like to ask the interviewer for when they ask. And to have an answer other than I want to travel for when they ask you why you want to work on board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should be that's more about kind of the a, uh, giving the guests a good experience, right? Something, something unselfish. Yeah, because it's the travel's kind of a given. You know, if we're re recruiting, we kind of always know that that's the number one reason. But yeah, have another reason. Sure. In your back pocket. Um, so you're Canadian. I'm from the states. I mean, they're. I know they hire people from those two countries, but I mean, for other people listening around the world, is it? Should they stick to cruise lines like? Like if you live in the EU, should do you have a better chance of being, I mean, I don't know how it works with permissions and everything like that. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Okay. So most cruise lines hire from almost every country in the world. Often what cruise lines will do is have official hiring partners in each country that they have, that they work with and have given permission to, to hire for them. So if you are in another country, I definitely recommend contacting a local official and these are often listed on the cruise line's main website via their employment pages. Um, recruitment partner. That is definitely what I would recommend first to do because, uh, you can work on a cruise ship really from whatever country, but you want to make sure that you're taking the right steps that will put you in the best position based on where you are. So here in Canada, for example, we have three official partners that kind of cover most of the major brands up here. So for Canadians, I always recommend that they try the partners first before applying to the main lines because you have a much higher probability of getting noticed at the partner level than trying to get noticed in the thousands of other applications that are coming into the main lines HR offices directly. I'm going to distill all of that advice you just gave to, to, 
to one sentence. Don't half-ass it, right? It's like you have to go for something specific. You have to really put your best foot forward, good picture, all the stuff you're talking about. You can't really kind of be blasé about it. I mean, you're applying for a job, and it, it sounds like it is very competitive. But at the same time, people get these jobs, you know? They've got to fill the positions, and they're looking for good people. Maybe that's you. If this sounds interesting, I don't know. If it is, we're going to have some uh, stuff to help you out. Last question. What are some of the things you got to do travel-wise outside of the cruise ship thing? Like, I think one of the things that's a big benefit is you have these contracts. You must have these spaces between contracts. Did you go on, like, adventures around the world during those times between contracts? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, a great question, I would, um, I did miss home quite a bit. So I was away during my last five years, I was sort of away, you know, four to six months at a time. So I'd always come back home to Canada for at least a month or so to visit family. And then yeah, I would often take adventures. So um, I went to Australia, New Zealand, um, just sort of backpacking around during my vacations, which was great. uh, Because during your vacation, after you've been on board for, you know, a few contracts, you sort of realize that, your home is the ship. So when you're on leave for that eight to 10 weeks in between, the world is sort of your home at that point, you can kind of go wherever. And you have the disposable income to do so because you've just finished a contract and, uh, and saved a bunch of money. So (laughs) you can head out. Yeah. Yeah, Well, if you don't uh, get enough travel on the cruise ship when you're working, then you can take your money and run off to another country and, and enjoy it till your next contract starts. And that's, uh, that's cruise ship life, I guess. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to chatting with you again soon. You too. Thanks so much again for having me. Of course. Cheers. There you go. I want to thank my guest today, my friend Amanda, for stopping by, sharing her wide and deep experience in the cruise ship job world to give you a better perspective, a realistic perspective on what you can expect working on board a cruise ship. If you are intrigued, if you are interested, if you are like, hmm, maybe this is a thing, zero to travel.com slash cruise is where you want to go. You should just go there right now and just bookmark it or save it to read later if you don't have time right now. We kept referencing We're going to share some stuff to help you out. We kept saying, got some stuff to help you out. That's what we're talking about, this companion piece. It's a very detailed resource that goes along with this podcast to help you get even more information about working on board cruise ships. And hey, this is how we roll here. You know, this is not for everybody, but for the right person, this might be a thing. And as you heard, the competition can be pretty stiff. So you want to get the edge. You want to have the the insight to get beyond what everybody else is going to do. People that are going to try this might either half-heartedly try or they might not know. They're going to try on the surface level, maybe apply for a few jobs, not really go deep with it. But you, my friends, because of these resources, you have the opportunity to go deep. So if you really truly want to do this, check it out, zerototravel.com slash cruise read that article. And then if you're interested even further, I highly recommend um, diving in with Amanda. She has a couple courses and books and different things that can even help you to the next level. So, uh, But start off zero to travel.com slash cruise. If you were interested in this podcast, you want to go deeper, definitely check out that companion piece there and let me know what you think. You can drop me an email anytime. And separate from cruise ship jobs, if you're just looking for information on travel jobs in general. I also recommend you go to zero to travel.com slash travel jobs, just all one word there, travel jobs right at the end. Take you to just a page, simple page where you can opt in to our wander work newsletter. And I'm going to be sending out updates on a variety of travel jobs as they cross my desk. Oh, if you could call it a desk, my floating desk out there in the world. Sometimes my desk is the one I'm standing at here in Norway in my apartment. Occasionally it's cafes or other random places because that's that's what I do. I kind of work all over the place and bring you this show because I love it. I'm truly passionate about sharing all of the different ways that you can build a life around your passion for travel and incorporate it with the things you like to do that are part of your personality as well. I truly believe that. It's not just about 
the travel. It's also about enjoying your daily life and, and having that perfect mixture of travel and personal satisfaction with how you're doing it and the way you're doing it. And I always say, I mean, there's basically three buckets to travel. You can save up money and just travel and not do anything. Just you know, spend the money you save and just travel. You can, of course, start a business that you can run from anywhere and do that whole location independent type of thing, work from the laptop. Or you can get a travel job and see the world that way. And I've done all three of those. And that's why I started this podcast after having those experiences personally over almost 20 years. And then talking to other people, meeting so many travelers out there when I was on the road, hearing how they did it, and then starting to meet other people through this podcast even that took it to another level. And and now I just see, yeah, there are so many ways that you can infuse travel into your life with the other things that you want to do in a way you want to do it. And this is, of course, just one of those ways. That's why I'm bringing you this travel job series It's not going to be for everybody, but it's going to be for some of you. So again, if you're interested in cruise ship jobs specifically, definitely check out the companion piece, zerototravel.com slash cruise and or zerototravel.com slash travel jobs, all one word to get on our Wander Work newsletter. And if you're like me and you keep putting things off, (laughs) don't put it off. If this is going to be something you're interested in, don't let it pass you by. You should just hit pause and do this right now. Just get on those lists or, or bring the bring that article up so you've got it ready to go and you can start making moves towards this if it's something you want to do. Now, I have to leave you with a quote because, hey, there are so many great metaphors around ships and cruising. And I liked this quote from Omar Bradley. Set your course by the stars, not by the lights of every passing ship. Have a great day. I'll see you next time. Take care. Cheers. This podcast has been brought to you by ZeroToTravel.com. Ideas and advice to make your travel dreams a reality. This is a Zero to Travel podcast bonus track back here with Amanda and... uh, I'm always curious to hear about the behind the scenes stories at these types of jobs. And I wanted to get one story from you related to uh to either the passengers or something that went down on the ship. Yeah. So this is uh from my days working as what's called youth security on board. And um so I was part of the security department for about a year or so and there are a lot of things that the security department gets to see for sure that happen, that go down. But one particular story I, I was there for or happened was um, we were in Jamaica, I believe. And of course, all of the guests coming back onto the ship, every port, everyone, you know, puts their cruise card into the little thing. They get their ID checked. They also have their bags scanned, you know, at every port. And that is just something typically that security staff were involved in at the gangways. And on this particular occasion, there was a gentleman who had his bags checked, but then he was patted down, which can sometimes happen just randomly. We do decide to do that. And in his pocket, we found a balloon full of white powder. And of course he was super, you know, he was very, very scared. He was super worried that this had been found on him. And what our security officer actually realized was that it was salt. Oh, really? (laughs) Yes. This passenger had been off in Jamaica. He had thought he had bought, you know, narcotics, but lucky for him, oh. he had been scammed oh my God. because there was nothing that we could do. I mean, he had a balloon full of salt. Right. Um, you know, he was very worried but and ended up just being very embarrassed, but also very lucky because it was just a balloon full of salt. <laughs> That's insane. Well, I mean, what happens then? Like if it was not salt, does he go back to the Jamaican authorities? Yeah, so I have, you know, it has happened. I have seen this happen as well, which was very unfortunate. There was a kid, um, actually, I think it might have been the same port, um, not that same day, but there was a kid who who had actually purchased contraband. Um, he was arrested by local authorities, so he was actually um, caught ashore, which people need to remember, when you're a passenger on a cruise ship and you get off, often you can be a target. So what sometimes happens is, 
sometimes the police and these dealers are in cahoots and you may b- purchase narcotics and then the police already know about it and then they're ready to arrest you. And then you'll need to pay a significant amount of money to get out of jail sometimes. Um, so keep that in mind. But so he was arrested, but was really sad. He, I think he was only like 19 or 20, but his mom was on board as well as his whole family. As security, we had, so he had already been arrested. He wasn't back on the ship. This had happened off the ship, but we, I had to go down and help pack up his things in a suitcase and bring it down to the gangway. We had to get his mom off. The rest of the family was staying on board. I mean, it was really, really sad. Wow. Um, Luckily, he did get out. I think there was some lawyers involved and um, um, agreements and things like that. So he did get out of it eventually. But um, yeah, so it's really serious. You got to be really careful as a passenger and as a crew member. Uh, That must have been a tough situation. I mean, these are this is what it's like. If you're working on the ship, you're going to see some ship go down, right? <laughs> and uh, wow, what a crazy, a balloon full of salt, man. That is the luckiest. Cause that guy's probably still telling that story in some bar somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. You know, it's like the one day he's so glad he bought bad non-existent drugs. <laughs> yeah. That either, that either turned his whole life around or he just like, it's just another story. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, yeah. thank you so much for uh for sharing that. I really appreciate it. No worries. Have a Thanks. Good day. <laughs>